Dan Lewis here at Facing Medical Group. I am the Regional Director for the San Fernando Valley here at Facing Medical Group, and I'm also the Chairperson for the Black Physicians Council here at Facing. We call it the BPC. Thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited. We have an awesome program for you today. The BPC was formed after the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor that rocked the nation. We decided that we'd like to form a group to help address the health care inequities in the black community. We know that there's a lot of fear and mistrust in this vaccine and the government, and we'd like to address that today. Layers of mistrust have been built in over the generations. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the role that black scientists and physicians have played in making this vaccine a reality. We'll also talk about the disease, the anti-vaccine, and how it works. And finally, we'll answer the questions that you may have. My guide through this conversation will be Dr. Rafael Montalvo, my esteemed colleague. But before we get started, let's introduce the folks at the BPC. Hi, I'm Tanya Thomas. I'm one of the facing gastroenterologists. I specialize in digestive diseases. I'm originally from Houston, Texas, but my father is from Jamaica and my mother is from Haiti. I've been with Facey since August of 2019. In my free time, I enjoy bike riding. Hi, my name is Dr. Chisabam Ani. I'm um, an internist with Facey Medical Group. I'm also a researcher and epidemiologist and hold faculty appointments at Charles Drew University and UCLA. Hello, I'm Dr. Anna Sophia Lopes. I'm a family physician. I currently work in the urgent care at Facey Medical Group. I've been with the medical group since 2007. I'm a past president of the Association of Black Women Physicians. My uh, roots are originally from West Africa. I'm Cape Verdean. I grew up in Rhode Island where I lived in a traditional Cape Verdean home where we spoke Creole and Portuguese. I later learned to speak Spanish uh, because I had several friends from Colombia and the Dominican Republic and they spoke Spanish. So I took a course in high school and was easily able to learn to speak Spanish. I live in the San Fernando Valley uh, with my husband. We have a blended family and we have three children. My name is Dr. Samuel Yamu. I am originally from Kenya. I moved into the United States in 2008 and did my residency in Omaha, Nebraska. My initial medical school training was in Kenya, where I am originally from. I worked in various locations in the US, and I moved to California and joined FACI about one year ago. I am very excited to be part of this discussion today. My name is Dr. Daniel Lewis. Uh, I've worked for FACI for the last 21 years. I'm an internist in the Tarzana facility. Uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C., went to college at Catholic University, and then to medical school at UCLA uh, School of Medicine. Hello, my name is Ryan West, and I'm a physician at Facey Medical Group uh, in the Department of Immediate Care. I've been there for a little over two years now, and I'm board certified in family medicine. And uh, this is my daughter, Eliana. She was born a little bit uh, over two months ago. I am Dr. Marie Ange Suma. I am an OBGYN physician practicing here in Mission Hill, California. I have been at FACI Medical Group for the past nine years, and I am a proud member of the Black Physician Council. Here at the BPC, we seek to empower our African-American patients to take excellent care of their health. Minority health and women's health is very close to my heart. I am originally from Guinea in West Africa, as well as the Democratic Republic of Congo in Central Africa. I was born in Kinshasa and emigrated to the United States approximately 27 years ago in order to go to college. I do speak fluent French as well as Spanish and I am conversant in Lingala and Kikongo. Thank you very much and welcome. Hi, my name is Rafael Montalvo. I'm a 
family doctor who's board certified in family medicine. Is currently working in the urgent care department at Facey Medical Group in two of their locations, one of which is in Valencia, California, the other in Mission Hills. Uh, I've been there for the past almost four years now, I believe. Um, made it a personal goal of mine to always provide extraordinary care using state-of-the-art technology as well as evidence-based medicine. To give you a little perspective about myself, I came from a military family. Both of my parents were in the Air Force and I was born in Germany. Uh, we didn't live there very long, ended up moving to Denver, Colorado, where I spent most of my formidable years growing up. And there, uh, I realized that I had a love for science and I participated in a lot of science activities. Didn't necessarily have a love for medicine right away. Um, it wasn't until later in my, almost in my senior year in college where I did a lot of design of robotics and uh, prosthetic limbs and a lot of intelligent biomedical devices where I actually really grew an appreciation for the human body and how dynamic and how beautiful the human body is. And from then on, I, I thought that a medicine would be a perfect fit for me and I fell in love with medicine. COVID-19 is a disease that's caused by a virus that belongs to a member of the coronavirus family called SARS-CoV-2. Um, the name of this family of viruses is derived from the appearance of the virus under the microscope, which is a crown-like appearance. Uh, it has nothing to do with the alcoholic beverage corona. COVID-19 is primarily a respiratory illness, so you can have symptoms like coughing and shortness of breath. Uh, but you can also have gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, additionally, you can have more systemic symptoms like fevers, chills, um, as well as muscle aches. So, COVID, the vaccine, and, and you know, how it works. And that's, that's really what I want to discuss with you briefly during this presentation. First things first, um, there are genuine concerns. You know, people ask, you know, um, is the vaccine safe? Is it effective? This technology is new. What do we know about it? Should I be taking it, right? So the first thing I want to tell you is real briefly, what does the coronavirus do to the host of a cell? When the, 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 the virus encounters a human host cell, what it does is it essentially injects a its own blueprint, its RNA into the human host cell. And it hijacks the part of the human host cell responsible for making proteins called the ribosome and essentially just makes replicas of itself enough to overwhelm the cell, burst out and go infect other cells and cause the same thing. Now, note that the, these cells, the host cells, our cells, your cells and my cells have DNA encased in what's called the nucleus. Traditionally, the DNA uses a messenger to ask the RNA, to ask the ribosome to make proteins. COVID virus itself does not interact with the DNA, it just hijacks the ribosome. Similarly, the vaccine as well, and I'll come to that in a little bit. How do we make vaccines? How have we made vaccines in the past? from you know, the, you know, smallpox and all of that, polio and all of that, things that have been effective and saved several you know, millions of lives over the past, past uh, decades. Well, typically we get either a weak version of an infectious organism or virus, we get a killed version of it, we get little bites of it, or we get organisms that can present some components with the overall aim of inducing our cell, uh, our body to produce defenses to produce antibodies that are ready to mount a fight the next time we encounter the virus. These antibodies are typically called neutralizing antibodies. That's the whole point of vaccines. We kind of mimic the infectious organism or virus to induce our body to get ready to fight them off. Okay. Now, this process takes time often, you know, to understand the, the organisms to develop them to get weakened versions and versions that don't cause disease so scientists said when covid came around it caused the devastation and mayhem that we've seen so far you know 450,000 dead in the u.s so far how can we do this in a safe effective way and quickly enough um, for us to have our bodies make antibodies to fight off this deadly virus well understanding that we can induce production of antibodies by getting a messenger that 
Canada has a, the code for, for part of the uh, COVID virus to induce our bodies, to produce antibodies, was exactly what they did. Um, and that's what you hear, you know, when they talk about the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna. This technology has been around for over a decade. It's been studied for influenza, Zika, rabies, cytomegalovirus. So it's not exactly new. It's new for COVID, but it's not new as a whole. And how they did it was, one, they decoded the COVID virus, they decoded the spike proteins, which you hear a lot about, uh, the, you know, the, the part that interacts with the human cell. And then they made that, these messengers that carry these, the blueprint from, for this, um, these spike proteins to induce antibody production. And then lastly, but, but not the least important, they tested to see if it was safe and effective. Now, how is this testing done? Four phases, essentially. They had the first phase of phase one with 20 to 100 volunteers. And they asked, is it safe? Are there serious side effects? How does the vaccine dose relate to any side effects? And is the vaccine causing any immune response, which is really what we wanted to do to induce our bodies to produce these antibodies or these, you know, um, defenses. The second phase was with more people, about 100 people, uh, um, several hundred volunteers, sorry. And the questions were, are there any short-term side effects, which is kind of what we're worried about now. What are the body's immune response? And are there signs that the vaccine is protective? Because what's the point of a vaccine and antibodies that are unprotected? And the final phase is, again, what we're excited about for these two um, vaccine candidates at the time, Pfizer and Moderna. It was a phase three, it's done with thousands of volunteers. And the questions are how do disease rates compare between people who get the vaccine and those who do not? And how well can the vaccine protect people from disease? And the final phase, the phase four, is typically, you know, after the vaccine is rolled out, there's ongoing collection of data to understand the long-term side effects. This whole process is regulated, and coordinated, supported by the government. And the COVID vaccines that we have in the market now have been held to the same safety standards, standards as other vaccines. There are some side effects. You can find those on the CDC website and some of the local um, health department web websites, fever, you know, muscle aches, headaches, you know, malaise, that kind of thing. Things we, you get, you know, when you get a flu vaccine or some other vaccines. But the C according to the CDC, no significant safety concerns were identified in the clinical trials, and it's unusual for s side effects to appear more than eight weeks after vaccination. Well, the final question people ask, you know, fine, well, it was safe and effective for everybody, but was it safe and effective for me? Did they test this in people like me? When you look at the distribution on this slide of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, it was tested in thousands of people, Pfizer 43,000, Moderna 30,000, now, in multiple clinical sites, now look at the racial ethnic distribution. It kind of looks like the United States, you know, there were African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, Native Americans, everybody. And the age distribution as well was there. So, this vaccine is safe, it's effective. We know there are no serious side effects, it's protective, and, you know, it's been tested in everybody, including you and I. So, I hope you consider taking it strongly. Thanks. two vaccines that have received the FDA's emergency use authorization. That's the Pfizer or BioTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. I would like to take some time to describe the two vaccines and compare them with you now. Let's first talk about effectiveness. Both vaccines are very highly effective. The Pfizer vaccine has been determined to be 95% effective and the Moderna vaccine is 94.5% effective. This is based off of manufacturer's data that was submitted to the FDA. Both vaccines use similar technology, the mRNA or messenger RNA technology. I know we discussed it earlier in the presentation, but just as a reminder, this allows you to be immune to the virus without ever actually being exposed to any components of the virus itself. Both vaccines require a two dose schedule, meaning that you need to have two separate injections in order to get the full immunity. It's just a different amount of time between the two vaccines, depending on the brand of vaccine that you're receiving. For Pfizer, there should be approximately three weeks or 21 days in between the two doses. For Moderna, there should be 28 days or approximately four weeks in between the two doses. A very popular question that I get from my patients is, how long will this protection from the vaccines last? 
that is still an area of ongoing interest. It is not entirely certain how long the vaccine will protect you against COVID-19. However, as more people get the vaccine, more data can be collected. One of the strengths of the existing research that is available for the two vaccines is that the studies involved a very diverse population. There were middle-aged adults, elderly, and people from different communities of color, including Latinos, Blacks, Asians, and Native Americans. This is all the current information that we have regarding the vaccines, their effectiveness, and their safety. However, if you would like to stay up to date and receive more and new information regarding these vaccines, I recommend you go to the link at the bottom of this slide. That's the FDA Emergency Preparedness and Response to Coronavirus Disease link. Now I'd like to talk about how the vaccine will be distributed within the community. This slide has a lot of information, but we're gonna tackle it phase by phase. There are four different phases, and these phases refer to how likely someone is to contract or get coronavirus, and how likely someone is to spread coronavirus to other members of society based on your occupation. The first phase is phase 1A. The estimated time frame for when the first dose of the vaccine should be received is in between December of 2020 all the way through February of 2021. This phase encompasses two different groups, healthcare workers and residents at a long-term care facility. Healthcare workers includes nurses, pharmacists, and physicians. Long-term care facility residents include people who live at a nursing home, people who live at a mental health home or a group home if you have mental health challenges, and people who live in a facility that requires a little bit more care than a nursing home, also known as a long-term acute care facility. Let's move on to phase 1B. The estimated time frame for when the vaccine will be available is early February 2021 to late March of 2021. Phase 1B encompasses multiple different groups. The first group is anyone who is age 65 or older. The second group includes people who in, are involved in education or childcare services. So that can include teachers, teaching assistants, counselors, principals, and people who work at daycare facilities or nannies. The next group who are at risk based off of their type of work include people who work in emergency services. That includes people who work at police departments or fire departments. And the last group includes people who work within food services and agriculture. So that can include people who are in the restaurant industry and people who are in the farming industry. Let's move on to phase 1B tier 2. This includes people who are at risk of getting or spreading coronavirus based on their work in the transportation and logistics industries, including people who work with or on cars, buses, trains, and planes. Also, people who work for industrial, commercial, residential, and sheltering facilities and services. Thirdly, people who work within the manufacturing industry or people who work factory jobs. And lastly, people who work in congregate settings with a risk of outbreak. That refers to people who live or work within the prison system or in homeless shelters. Let's move on to phase 1C, which is estimated to take place in between March of 2021 all the way through early May 2021. Phase 1C includes adults ages 50 to 64. It also includes adults ages 16 to 49 who have a pre-existing medical condition that puts them at increased risk of serious infection from coronavirus. That can include pre-existing conditions like cancer, it can include HIV, it can include using immunosuppressants or medications that weaken the immune system and the body's ability to fight off disease. It also includes people who work in the following sectors that puts them at increased risk of getting or spreading coronavirus based on their work within water or wastewater, chemicals, defense, energy, hazardous materials, communications and information technology, financial services, including banking, government operations, and essential community functions. We're on our final phase, phase two. This is a proposed phase that should take place in between May 
to early June of 2021. In this phase, all adults in between the ages of 16 to 49 without any serious high-risk medical conditions will be eligible to receive the vaccine. As a reminder, I wanna let you know that these are just tentative dates that are subject to change. Also, this particular vaccine schedule is specific to the state of California. If you live in a state outside of California, I recommend that you check the Department of Public Health for your state to receive the most up-to-date recommendations about vaccine availability. A lot of the vaccine hesitancy that we see today stems from the Tuskegee experiment in the 1930s. At this time, researchers tr decided to conduct experiment and view the effects of untreated syphilis on African Americans. There was treatment available, but the reckless scientists decided to withhold it. Hundreds of men uh, died and then several more had permanent neurological damage because of this experiment. In the 1970s, the United States government did apologize and awarded the families a $10 million settlement. President Clinton also issued an apology to the survivors um, and their families, but the damage was done and the trust was broken. Since then, we are, uh, we've learned from the past and we now have several sa safety monitoring programs in effect, especially when it comes to this new mRNA technology in the COVID vaccine. There are robust safety monitoring systems that are in place to ensure that what happened in Tuskegee will never happen again. We know representation matters. Black lives matter. Black doctors matter. That's part of the reason why the BPC was formed, the Black Physician Council here at Facey Medical Group. Uh, other organizations such as the Association of Black Women Physicians and the National Medical Associations exist so that we can strengthen our diversity and we can build back the trust that was lost. The slide from the African American Research Collaborative and the NAACP shows us that the black community still sees their physicians, uh, their, their nurses, and their hospital team as trusted messengers in the community. And this was extremely reassuring. As a trusted messenger, safety was one of the top priorities in the COVID-19 vaccine trials. There are several regulatory bodies that are constantly evaluating and monitoring the safety and side effects of these vaccines. But I just wanna point out um, that after two months of the trials, uh, after the, the second dose of the vaccine was given to the participants in the research trials, these were huge trials with 70,000 individuals in them. To, it's safe to say that if you didn't develop a side effect within the first two weeks or even month, it's less likely that you're going to develop a side effect at the end of eight weeks or after eight weeks. In addition to the regulatory bodies that are overseeing the COVID-19 vaccine safety and efficacy, there are independent groups of black physicians that are being formed to continue to monitor the safety of the COVID-19 vaccination. The image that you see is of Dr. Kizzy Cormitt, who was a lead scientist in the Moderna vaccine uh, development trial. And she's attending the vaccine inoculation of Reverend Jesse Jackson. Our black scientists and physicians were involved in every step of the COVID-19 vaccine development process. If we had at least one third of the representation then in the 1930s, something as horrific as the Tuskegee experiment may have never have happened. Willingness to accept the vaccine is uh, continuing. We have people on the extreme left who will not get a vaccine at whatever the cost. And you have people on the extreme right who are ready and willing to, do, to get a vaccine and are demanding for the vaccine. 
the majority of us are in the middle and we are agreeable to getting the vaccine but some people are more hesitant and have a wait and see approach waiting for more information waiting for a new vaccine uh, waiting to see what happens to the people who get the vaccine there are several people who are belong to certain special population because they have certain illnesses or certain conditions like pregnancy, breastfeeding, people receiving certain medications or cancer treatment who are seeking more information to know whether to go ahead with the process of getting a vaccine. There are some black people who do not want to be part of the experiment and wants to delay, they want to see what's going to happen. The fear we have is delaying getting a vaccine may lead to more death. And we have been seeing new deaths in our county, in our communities every day. And we want to prevent this. And the way we know how at this time is to get a vaccine. Those people who have individual concerns, medical concerns, are definitely recommend seeking their personal physician opinion and see if it's okay for them to get the vaccine but they should not just do it just because they are not sure there are newer vaccines in the limelight coming up which are more traditional vaccine like a DNA vaccine like the one being produced by AstraZeneca Johnson & Johnson and some of the people who don't feel comfortable they want to wait for this vaccine and that may be okay however during this time while most of us are waiting for the vaccine you know the lines are long we know that it takes some time to get to get in to get a vaccine the appointments are far and far apart we recommend we continue mitigation let's continue wearing our masks let's continue washing our hands and keeping physical distance Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Danny Lewis again. I'd like to introduce a short video from the Black Coalition Against COVID. This is a coalition of black doctors and nurses from Charles Drew University, Howard University, and Harry College, and Morehouse Medicine. Dear Black America, we love you. We affirm that black lives matter. And as black health professionals, we have a higher calling to stand for racial justice and to fight for health equity. In the spirit of unconditional love for every single black American, we have locked arms in an initiative to place the health and safety of our community at the heart of the national conversation about COVID-19. Respect for our black bodies and our black lives must be a core value for those who are working to find the vaccine for this virus that has already taken so many of our loved ones. Our colleagues across healthcare know that we are urging our community to take safe and effective vaccines once available. However, for this to be successful, they must do more to earn your trust now and in the future. We are on the front lines in care delivery and in key decision-making roles, from the lab, to the clinic, to the virtual boardroom. We urge you to hold us accountable. Please wear your masks, continue social distancing, hand washing, and avoiding indoor events until vaccines are widely available. With the holidays around the corner, we want nothing more than to break bread with our loved ones but tradition cannot stand in the way of our health. We also ask you to join us in participating in clinical trials and taking a vaccine once it's proven safe and effective. We know that our collective role in helping to create a vaccine that works for black people and that we trust has an impact on our very survival. Please visit blackcoalitionagainstcovid.org slash loveletter to learn more about the work we are doing to keep our beloved community safe. We will keep you in our hearts, 
while we work to create a world that is healthier and more just than the one we know today. Love, America's Black Doctors and Nurses. So I believe that vaccination is a critical part of just basic health care. I've had the opportunity to visit a variety of different countries and I've noticed that in um, some of the countries that I've visited, you can clearly see in the areas um, where, in those countries that have been either vaccine deficient or um, usually socioeconomic uh, challenges have prevented the dissemination of certain vaccines, you can clearly see that the importance of vaccination. Um, some places where the polio vaccine has not been uh, readily available, people actually do suffer from polio. Levels of disfigurement, other diseases, hepatitis vaccine, people um, can have long-term sequelae, including cancer if not properly vaccinated. So uh, in this case, I think the COVID vaccine is a critical, another critical technology that's available at our fingertips. And I would highly recommend that those who are able to get it should get it and that um, it's, it would be beneficial in, in the fact that our technology uh, that is, is being implemented in the vaccine has been highly touted as being safe. This pandemic has shown us who is really essential in our lives. I got the COVID-19 vaccine to protect my family, to protect my friends, to protect my coworkers, to protect my sisters at ABWP, to protect my mom friends at Mocha Moms of San Fernando Valley. And I also got it to protect my 83 year old mother who I haven't hugged in over a year. I think it's important that we all do our part to help end this pandemic. The reason I decided to get the vaccine is because being a healthcare professional, I'm exposed every day and that risk spread over to my family and my community. I have done my own research on the vaccine and uh, reading about all the studies and analyzing the data and I feel confident that this vaccine will make a big difference not only to myself but also to the entire community. Thank you. I decided to get the COVID-19 vaccine because I have a wife and a young daughter at home and I didn't want to bring anything into the house uh, from outside. So it was a decision that I felt I, I could best protect my family by getting the vaccine. Ready? Yeah. Go ahead and Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Rafael Montalvo. I'd like, on behalf of the Black Physician Council, I'd like to say thank you and welcome for uh, taking your time out this afternoon to, to join us. Um, as you know, uh, the past 12 months has been a, a critical time for, for the globe in general. Um, I like to say that we've been involved in a health renaissance. We've actually been able to walk away um, knowing that, uh, being reassured that um, there's a certain level of resiliency uh, within humanity. If you look at the World Health Organization's data, there's been over 104 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 throughout the world. Unfortunately, about two, um, two and a half million of those um, 
suffered from uh, from a death or did not succumb to the actual infection itself. If you think of this in a half full, uh, half cup full mentality, you can see that our minds, our bodies and souls have shown the spirit of survival have overcome the spirit of death. Within inspiration, there are spawns out of desperation. Oftentimes, uh, this breeds innovative ways to use old technology and development of new technologies. Currently, there's over 300 treatments under development and 200 of those are currently in clinical trials. We can always attribute that to uh, the global partnership efforts that are coordinated and accelerate research and development. Today, we're gonna discuss one of those technologies and that's the COVID vaccine. Um, our goal today is hopefully have you walk away with a sense of security and confidence about making an educated and informed decision about whether the vaccine is right for you. Hopefully we are able to encourage and inspire you to make that next step and actually get the vaccine. We're going to try to answer some of the most common questions about the vaccine and field questions from you as an audience during this town hall discussion. So please feel free to add in uh, comments into the text box and we'll try to address them as, uh, as, as appropriately as we can. Well, let me go ahead and introduce some of the participants that we've got today. Some of the best doctors this side of the Mississippi, if you ask me. We've got Dr. Chiselbaum Ani, he's representing internal medicine. We've got Dan Lewis representing internal medicine. We've got Tanya Thomas representing gastroenterology by way of internal medicine. We've got Anna Lopes, family medicine. Ryan West, family medicine. Samuel Nayamu representing internal medicine. And myself, yours truly, Rafael Montalvo representing family medicine. Um, as you know, there's currently at least three variants of the COVID-19 circulating in the United States right now, and each of those have had their effects essentially across the globe where they were first detected. Um, right now, there's been a huge concern for some of the vaccine's effectiveness, effectiveness and the necessity to keep getting booster shots after each vaccination or after each mutation um, has been identified. Um, Dr. Nayamu, I pose this question to you. Do you think the vaccine will be effective against these mutated strands? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my take on this is one, we don't know for sure. Uh, we are working, you know, we're getting more information, we're getting new data every day. Uh, the Moderna company and the Pfizer company are giving information and they're kind of, they're running concurrent uh, research on these new strains. And the, the preliminary information they're giving us is that there is a good chance that there is some coverage, but we don't know for sure. So there, there is uh, talk about, you know, having in the future, uh, having booster vaccines, which may incorporate these new new uh, uh, strains. And, 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 and then, uh, you know, as we go on from, from the, the technology of MRA, we know that they can be able to, 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 to alter a little bit of the on, on the on the on the vaccine and be able to actually cover those uh, strains. So for now, you know we are hopeful and we think that there is a good chance that we might be able to in the future be able to have all those answers. Wonderful. Thank you for that response. Um, next, you know we've got there's the idea that. Uh, Certain communities tend to get harder than others, get hit harder than others, correction. And, um, you know, the COVID vaccine or the COVID virus in general hit LA pretty hard. We were actually the epicenter. And I know that we had the Cal C um, mutation of the vaccine. Uh, as part of that, uh, maybe that could be a source of why LA was hit so hard. But Dr. Ani, could you explain to us maybe if there's any other uh, reasons why Los Angeles was hit, so, was hit so hard in comparison to the other parts of the world? Um, my video feed is not on right now, but um, you know, there are a few reasons. California is the most popular state in the, in the country, and uh, Los Angeles is uh, the most populous uh, county as well, per capita. So there are a whole lot more people here. So as, as a function of the actual crude numbers, you'd expect more infections here. We didn't have that initially. New York took most of the hit. Um, but, you know, a few months down the line, we, we got a big upsurge and it's, it's really multiple reasons, uh, partly some social demographics, uh, a higher proportion of vulnerable populations, you know, houseless folks, um, uh, immigration status, 
issues related with access to care, initial testing, crowding because of the housing issues. Um, again, California is, you know, warm weather, lots more outdoorsy activities. We kind of also relaxed, you know, going from the experience we had um, at the onset of the, the pandemic, you know, and, you know, we, we weren't as, as safe as we, we, we should have been. And then finally, as far as the you know um, hospital uh, hospitalization rates, California, particularly Southern California, has uh, significantly lower hospital beds per thousand population. Actually, we have the the least beds per, per population. I think it's 1.8 to every thousand people. And compare that with South Dakota, for example, it has 4.8 to every thousand people. The average in the U.S. is 2.4. So multiple reasons, you know, vulnerable populations, large uh, populations, geography, and that kind of thing. Um, good thing is, you know, in the past two weeks, things seem to have started to trend down, at least in the hospitals. But we still need to continue to be safe, and we all need to be encouraged to take the vaccine. You know, I couldn't hear the question. I don't know if anybody oh, I'm, else. I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. Uh, I know we've been trying to to have uh, a lot of co uh, mentioning that there should be some social distancing. However, this time of year, there are a lot of COVID babies being born. Uh, the question I have for you is, are there any fertility issues with the COVID-19 vaccine? <laughs> well, um, first of all, um, let's talk, let's get back to the housing question, the, the issue about LA and why it was hit so hard. You know, this notion of medicine and public health existing in separate uh, entities is actually false. They were meant to coexist. And so as Dr. Ani pointed out, the housing crisis here in LA has really impacted our COVID uh, transmission and the deaths that we've seen. And even then, I know some people have compared California to Florida. We are a state of about 40 million versus uh, Florida is half of that. So they're not exactly quite the same. But if you are living in one of those multi-generational homes and you are keeping that COVID circle tight, as we hope you are, and your partner is in, um, is in that circle and you guys are pregnant, um, we don't have data on fertility, but the World Health Organization is uh, recommending um, women who are currently pregnant and are in the high risk categories, such as the one that Dr. Thomas described, they should have a discussion with their physician to determine if the COVID vaccine is right for them. Unfortunately, we don't have the long-term data. Moderna did do some research um, in animals and the rats that were pregnant didn't have any out adverse outcomes, but there are no human trials. So I wanna make that um, very clear. Awesome. In the same vein, I know I've got a lot of friends and family that are actually either planning to uh, get pregnant or have recently um, or getting ready to to deliver or have a baby themselves. And I know um, we already know that there is passive immunity, meaning that mother can, um, through breast milk, deliver antibodies to the uh, to the baby. Um, and is there any argument or data out there that you're aware of uh, arguing for or against the fact that um, a mother who gets a COVID vaccine will actually pass on that immunity to the uh, to the baby, especially since the vaccine is at this point is only eligible for uh, or available for those uh, individuals 16 and older. So there's still a vulnerable population, the younger that um, are not developing their immunity. Do, have you heard anything or aware of anything related to that? Yeah. So first of all, um, you cannot get COVID or give COVID to your baby if you get the vaccine and you're breastfeeding. So I just want to make that clear. And you can't get COVID from getting the vaccination. So um, that those points need to be separated out. Um, there is enough data 
that the World Health Organization has recommended that moms who are breastfeeding should continue to breastfeed after they've received their COVID-19 vaccination. As Dr. Ani mentioned in the presentation, this is an mRNA um, vaccine. It is not a DNA. It does not affect the nucleus or the, the, the brain of the cell. Um, if you will. So it's felt safe. Also, the mRNA that's injected into your arm is denatured um, in, the, in the cells within your muscles. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't perpetuate, perpetrate in your body, per perpetuate in your body or go into the baby. So the World Health Organization has released that statement. Okay, thank you very much. And this question will go out to Dr. West. Um, you know, obviously we want to try and promote uh, the vaccine for those who are, uh, again, in our vulnerable populations. We talk about when we're going to disseminate this vaccine and how, who gets it first. I know there's a large percentage of our population that are either immunosuppressed um, or have autoimmune diseases that, uh, you know, um, make them immune suppressed. We're talking about HIV, autoimmune diseases like lupus. Um, is there any uh, thing that you're aware of? That should these populations actually get the COVID vaccine? So great question. Um, the, the purpose of the vaccine, um, I mean, is to give you immunity to the virus. So um, as part of that, you do need a functioning immune system. So those folks who, you know, for example, if, you're, if you have cancer and you're receiving um, uh, chemotherapy and your immune system is wiped out, I mean, that's debatable as to whether or not you need um, to take the vaccine. Um, but I will say that not everyone who is immunosuppressed is gonna have a non-functioning immune system. You can have, you know, for example, in this study, uh, there is a population of HIV patients who were demonstrated to have high CD4 counts and low viral loads and a, therefore a functioning immune system. So those HIV patients, as we typically think of as being immunosuppressed, nevertheless showed enough immune system function that they could receive benefit from the virus or from the vaccine, excuse me. So long story short, I mean, I, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. It's, it's gonna be decided on a case by case basis. And I would say that in terms of, you know, asking yourself like, should I get the vaccine? I would consult with your physician first if you have um, an immunosuppressive condition such as lupus or, or HIV. Unfortunately, um, you know, those people specifically with lupus were not necessarily included in the vaccine trials. So in that specific um, population, I don't think we can definitively answer at this time. But like I said, uh, please consult with your physician. Dr. Montalvo, you're muted again. Sorry, there you go. So, Dr. Montalvo, you were muted. Um, I, I assume you're you were talking to me. So, uh, I'll talk about contraindications about uh, this vaccine. Now, when it comes to to people that shouldn't get the vaccine, basically, um, if you're allergic to this vaccine, you shouldn't get it. Um, that mean, and this is a brand new vaccine, this is a brand new virus, who knows if you're allergic to it. So um, I think this says you're all inclusive, please get the vaccine. Um, if you are highly allergic, if, if you have anaphylaxis when it comes to things, consult your physician. Otherwise, I'd say go get it. All right, awesome. I, uh, sorry for the mutedness. Um, a question I was gonna you know, there's some concern about it. You know, the government get if you get the vaccine, it's a form of manipulation that the government is trying to control the population, implantation of chips and things like that. If you weigh in on that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love this question. Um, clearly, there's no chips in this vaccine. Um, uh, mind uh, control uh, with this vaccine is not going to happen. Um, it, as Dr. Uh, Lope said, um, it does not get into your DNA. It does not affect your genetic material. Um, this is, is, is more skepticism than anything else. 
It does not control your mind. There is no chip in this vaccine. Now, uh, the companies, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and there'll be uh, further companies coming up, um, they are controlled by regulatory bodies and um, their product has to be safe. Um, the government uh, had fronted these companies money to get the vaccine, but they have really no control after that. Gotcha. All right, thank you. So I, on a daily basis, I think probably all of us have experienced uh, the question, you know, I've gotten COVID now, or I was in line to get the vaccine. I, now I got COVID, oh, man, am I still eligible to get the vaccine? Dr. Thomas, can you still get the vaccine if you had COVID in the past? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So that's an excellent question, Dr. Montalvo, and it's a very common question. If you had COVID in the past and you were treated with plasma or monoclonal antibodies, then it's recommended that you wait 90 days after being treated with those therapies before you get the COVID-19 vaccine. Overall, we are encouraging people, even if you previously have had COVID-19 infection, to get the COVID-19 vaccine to protect yourself and to protect others. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question that looks like, um, uh, did the clinical trial cohort include black people with multiple chronic conditions? Is, is Dr. Ani on? He can answer that question. Sorry, yeah, that was uh, de dedicated to him. I don't see him on. Um, Dr. West, I think you can answer this question. So the, yeah, the sample size of the, I'm sorry, let me just, um, I okay. believe it's 10%. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, you're right. So the, in terms of the um, folks who were included in the um, clinical trial, you know, what percent of the population had chronic condition, like Dr. Montalvo alluded, I believe it was about 10% or so. Um, so the folks who have, you know, diabetes, um, heart failure, uh, COPD, they were included in the trial and the effects of the vaccine uh, were, were uh, seen in that population. It was demonstrated to be efficacious. And so um, if you have these chronic conditions, it's actually very important that you get the vaccine because um, what we're seeing is that those folks with chronic medical conditions tend to be a little bit more susceptible to the um, poor outcomes associated with uh, COVID-19 infection. So please, by all means, get the vaccine. Um, yes. But if Dr. Ani has anything else that he'd like to add, I uh, more than appreciate uh, his input. Dr. Arnie, are you still there? Uh, Dr. Arnie, uh, in addition, do you recommend one vaccine over the other if you were able to answer? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry my video feed is having some trouble. Um, the vaccine trial did have um, a adequate representation of uh, folks with multiple chronic medical comorbidities, like you mentioned, um, especially because, you know, they're, they're particularly vulnerable to, to, to getting infect infections and adverse event events including mortality. I don't necessarily recommend one vaccine over the other. I think, you know, um, basically we're go probably going to get the vaccines based on availability. The data is, is you know, readily available on the FDA and, um, and um, CDC website. I'll just go over real quickly what the different efficacies are. The Pfizer-Moderna vaccine overall well, was protected from uh, new infections in about 95% of people who got it. Specifically after the second dose, um, only eight people got it in the, in, the, uh, in the group that received the intervention. And uh, um, I believe it was 190, 196 in the folks who, who didn't who got the placebo. Uh, Moderna vaccine was about overall 94.1% effective. I think something that gets lost sometimes is, is that the Moderna vaccine was actually somewhat more protective in people in communities of color. Obviously, it would have to do with 
or they'd have to subject it to more stratified analysis. It was actually 97.5% protected in uh, communities of color. The AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not an mRNA vaccine, and I think that and the Johnson & Johnson are undergoing emergency review um, um, for authorization currently, where AstraZeneca was about 70.4% protective overall, and then the Johnson & Johnson overall was 72% effective in the U.S. and 85% effective overall preventing severe disease. But I don't necessarily recommend any vaccine over 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 the other, and I and I I don't do not think the CDC or the FDA do as well. Awesome, thank awesome. you. Thank you. Well, I think the key is to get the actual vaccine, whether regardless of which one you choose, they're equally going to going to be surmountably effective. Um, I, I guess Dr. Lopes, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, you know sequelae from getting the vaccine. There's been talk of you know Bell's palsy, other neurological disorders, disorders that'll have you um, you know some sort of ascending weakness, meaning weakness starting your feet and working your way up your body, also known as Guillain-Barre. Is there any you know worry with regards to that, including that those type of uh, illnesses or um, you know sequelae from getting the vaccine or other things? Do you, have you heard anything like that? You're on mute. Thanks. So we actually have that data. Um, Guillain-Barre is when the immune system attacks the nervous system. So your own body attacks itself and it's thought to be triggered by a virus or a bacteria. Go back to what we've been talking about. There's some feedback. The the mRNA technology does not enter your nucleus and there's no viral particles, there's no egg, there's no animal products in this mRNA technology. So after eight weeks, the incidence of Guillain-Barre was zero in both the Moderna and the Pfizer. Now Bell's palsy, we did see incidents of Bell's palsy um, in the trials, but it wasn't higher than what we see in the in the normal population. So if you took 100,000 individuals, four of them may develop Bell's palsy, which is what we see in the general population. So it's safe to say that the data shows us that there isn't an increased incidence of Guillain-Barre because there's no DNA associated with the mRNA vaccination and um, Bell's palsy. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, looks like there's a question on the board here. Um, you know, something is any idea of what the vaccine is made with specifically? Maybe Dr. Ani might be able to answer that. Yeah, so so the vaccine has, you know, there have been questions about does it contain eggs? Does it contain um you know, certain components, uh, does it contain fetal products and things like that? And that, the answer to that, at least by the CDCs and, and the manufacturers of the vaccine is, it, it doesn't contain uh, preservatives, latex and that kind of thing, no. Some of the mRNA material is made from, you know, recombinant technology where they kind of, you know, build proteins from the scratch. Um, and, um, um, what was the second question about that? Um, Not really, just what it is, what it is made of. Um, yeah, so the, the, the specific components, there are lots of components, but mainly lipids, the you know glycoproteins that make up the, the mRNA strands itself um, for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, for the um, uh, Johnson & Johnson and adenovirus uh, for the uh, for, um, for AstraZeneca had, had a weakened adenovirus that uh, carries the the, um, the genetic material for inducing spike protein production. The Johnson & Johnson is actually also an adenovirus, but it does contain a double-strand DNA for inducing the spike protein as well. But those, again, just so you know, are still under approval, the, the last two, the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. But it does not contain any of the material. You know, it's not derived from fetal embryo. It doesn't have eggs. It doesn't have latex. It doesn't have preservatives. Most of these things are made from the scratch. 
Awesome. Yeah, I've heard that uh, people being concerned about fetal products and things being involved in it. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, Dr. Lewis, I mean, there's there's a question on the board about, you know, this pandemic versus the, uh, the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. And they're wondering, was there any vaccines available at that time? And, you know, kind of how does that differ? How does the two now and then, uh, you know, what's different between that, if you're able to answer that at all? No, thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's take a step back. Um, there are viruses and viruses have families and uh, the Spanish flu was an influenza uh, family. Um, this is in the coronavirus family. Literally, there are hundreds of different types of coronaviruses. This is COVID-19. Now, it's, it's interesting to me that in medical school, there was one sentence on the coronavirus. It said um, the common cold is caused by the coronavirus, adenovirus, and adenovirus. That's it. This uh, small, insignificant um, virus has really brought the world to its knees. Now, the reason is because it's brand new. Humans have never seen it before. And, uh, you know, I also do hospital medicine. And I realized that this virus gets into the body in certain people for some reason and just starts a cascade of inflammation that just cannot be stopped. And unfortunately, sometimes it equals death. So um, it's a brand new uh, uh, type of coronavirus that unfortunately has, has been unleashed on the world. Mm. Thank you. Certainly, certainly has. Um, Dr. West, uh, have you know, are you aware of any deaths specifically associated with the administration of the COVID virus or COVID vaccine, sorry, COVID vaccine, more specifically maybe in the elderly population? Uh, excellent question. Um, so I'm not aware of anyone specifically getting the vaccine and then dying as a result of the vaccine. Um, I understand that people, um, well, I should say that the news likes to report a lot of a lot of sensational stories that's what's going to grab your attention and so i mean like a quick google search right now i typed in deaths from covid 19 vaccine and i found a story about uh, some virginia woman woman uh passing away after she got a, the first dose of the pfizer vaccine but again it's it's there's been no direct association that you know because she got the vaccine and then she died afterwards it's because of the vaccine so that kind of thing I understand is reported, but I can tell you there's been hundreds of thousands of doses of the COVID-19 vaccine being administered, and there haven't been any reported deaths as a result of the vaccine itself. So my money's on getting the vaccine and you being okay and, and not having any uh, um, death as a result of the vaccine. You may, there, I, mean, some, I think we've already talked about the potential side effects of the vaccine, um, which can be, you know, uh, something as minor as getting a little uh, soreness in the arm. That's what I had with my vaccine administration, um, as all the way up to, you know, some chills as well. So it, it's, um, it's it, I understand it's it's what uh, grabs the headlines, but uh, what should grab the headlines is successful vaccines administered, no one dies from the vaccine. Awesome, thank you. So we got a question, Dr. Lopes, maybe be able to answer this one, you know, uh, most vaccines take about 10 years to develop, and this vaccine was essentially developed or in the phase of development, but was released within like a six month window. It, it, are you able to weigh in in terms of why that was? I know the innovation is the you know source of desperation and we got to release things, but is there any logic to why this one in particular was released so fast? Yeah, um, part of the reason why this seems so rushed to so many people was, number one, this is not the United States COVID-19, um, you know, pandemic. This is a global pandemic. There are over 150 vaccines in development. This mRNA technology was already on the shelf. We had seen SARS before, which COVID-19 is a coronavirus but it's a mutated coronavirus. So we were already in vaccine development for SARS. So we grabbed that mRNA technology and said, hey, can we turn this into a vaccine safely? And that's what was done. I think it was brilliant. Um, the, the, the efficacy, nothing was rushed. There were no shortcuts. 
It was an eight week trial and it was a massive trial. It was 70,000 individuals. And this was a concerted effort by uh, many companies to kind of help end this pandemic. And I just wanna kind of rewind and talk about Dr. Lewis's question about the Spanish flu. In early 1900s, we did not have a vaccine. So how did it go away? Someone ha asked. It's what we're asking people to do and what Dr. Inyamu talked about. We really need people to help us mitigate their risk and continue to hand wash. That's what they did in 1918. They also disinfected things and they practiced social distancing. People were afraid to go out. So um, that's how we were able to, to beat it and get out of it two, three years later. So that's what we're asking people to do in addition to the vaccination. Awesome. Great answer, great answer for that. There's also some, you know, anyone is kind of able to answer or chime in on this one. You know, there's a lot of concern that people think that um, a part of it is uh, the economy or segments of the economy, say big pharma in particular, hasn't been doing well when it comes to medication uh, administration or medication sales. And now this is the opportunity for them to take advantage and grab that American dollar or global dollar. Um, in terms of you know presenting this vaccine and making it available um, i know that the vaccine is it was already purchased and it's used with taxpayer dollars and given at no cost and obviously the cost um, comes out when you have to administer there's a fee to, to be able to administer the vaccine it, is there anyone who thinks that or can weigh in on terms of the the thought that big pharma or whatever is really just preventing the, producing this vaccine in an effort to kind of restart the economy and even line their own pockets uh, I, I can take a stab at this and I'll say hopefully not, <laughs> number one. Uh, but I'd like to take a step back in terms of why are we here. Um, the black community has been relatively a slow adopter to this vaccine and, um, and the goal of vaccine needs to be discussed. If we want to get to this herd immunity, uh, 70 to 85 percent of the population needs to be vaccinated. Um, Black, the black community comprises about um, 12 to 14 percent of our population. Now, if they, they say 33 percent of the of the black community does not want to get uh, the vaccine. So it is our responsibility to really bring the, the information and the knowledge about this vaccine and about vaccination itself that it is very important that we all get vaccinated. If we're going to reach that herd immunity so we can see our families again, so we can hug our grandmothers again, uh, so we can go outside and, and play basketball with our kids again, uh, we have to get vaccinated. And um, that's why I say uh, the role of the government is minimal in this. Um, uh, I hear your, your, your points about big pharma and, and, the, and the good old green dollar, but I think it comes back to uh, let's try to get back to a normal society, and this vac vaccine is a is a uh, bridge to that. Dr. Lewis, if I may add to that, you know one of the one of the concerns people raised when the HIV epidemic came came out and it affected you know disproportionately minority populations was well, I bet big pharma could have gotten a vaccine for it, but there's more money in treating it, right? You can make the same argument here as well. If you if you create a drug to get rid of a disease, I mean, you make money out of it, but you potentially make more money if the disease perpetuates itself and you have to treat it indefinitely. I think that the obligation is, was both moral in coming up with this vaccine and, you know, big pharma as well are part of the society. They don't, <laughs> everyone wants to get back to life as usual. So no one's targeting anybody as far as I'm concerned. And and then when people say, you know, why is the black black community being being specifically targeted, like Dr. Lewis mentioned, we're slow adopters of the vaccine. And as they say, you know, why why did the thief love the bank? Because that's where the money's at. We work, I work in the hospital setting like Dr. Lewis as well. And we see disproportionate, um, disproportionately how this affects minority African American or Latino communities. I could tell you that you know majority of the patients I, I admit are from these communities. All right, thank you. Um, we, there's a great question on here that uh, honestly talks about you know uh, 
kind of healthcare disparities uh, amongst the minority population, particularly amongst blacks is that, you know, they have less uh, access to cars and vehicles or even less uh, access to computers, which limits their ability to make appointments, to get vaccines, to get to the actual vaccine center. Um, why, are, why is that the case? Why are vaccines so inaccessible at this moment to minorities who need them the most, apparently? I'm not sure who wants to answer that, if, if it's answerable at all at this time. Maybe the group should answer it, because I know Dr. Lopes wants to chime in. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, honestly, the way I look is that this pandemic has really uncovered uh, the nation's ills altogether. And one of the ills is um, the inequities that, uh, that black, the black community has in healthcare. And um, um, for the black community not to have the vaccine, it goes along with everything else um, in terms of deficient uh, 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 medications and, and everything else. So uh, it, it's not surprising to me that uh, the vaccine accessibility is decreased. Um, but hopefully uh, uh, programs like this can help spur on that demand. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I agree with what was said. Um, we're really trying to work to level the playing field and discuss health equity. That's what that's why you know you see many black physicians coming on in addition to our full time jobs our roles as parents, our role as caregivers, our role as a you know, homeschool teacher, we're now taking this upon ourselves because we want to make sure that we, we uh, reach immunity, that we help end this pandemic, and that we don't see any more disproportionate deaths and suffering in our own community. So that's why it's so important. We really are working to address the friction points and we know they're there. We know that there are vaccine sites where the people who are going to the, get the vaccines do not live in those communities. Um, we know that the lines are long. Um, we know that some people have side effects and then they don't have access to care. So we know all of these things. We're just working within the system to kind of make it right. And so we just wanted to let people know that we are aware, you're not mistaken, it's appropriate to have healthy skepticism and we understand where it's coming from. Awesome. Let's see if there are any other questions or concerns out there. Another question about... Yeah. Um, a question about, oh yeah, the role of vitamin D when folks catch COVID-19. Um, the thought there's, you know, we always talk about giving vitamin D, zinc. There's been some disputes about if giving vitamin D, what the level to give, how much to give, how many units, things like that. Is anyone able to weigh in in terms of what the current recommendations are for vitamin D? I, I actually give vitamin D to to all my COVID admitted patients. I'm not sure what what's done in our patient um, uh, setting. There, there are some studies, and um, in, uh, including um, you know among minority populations, that suggest that vitamin D does somewhat modulate uh, the immune response. More it, 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 regarding COVID in particular, you know, uh, as some of you may have heard. The, the, the course of COVID typically is, you know, folks get mild asymptomatic disease, some folks get more moderate to severe disease. And, and, and typically there's a there's a there's a time or the temporal relationship, you know, folks tend to get worse up to a certain point and then improve or get even 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 more severe disease and potentially die. But this is associated with the hyperimmune response, something called a cytokine storm that often happens. And I've, I've actually reviewed some studies that suggest that vitamin D may help attenuate or dampen the, that cytokine storm. Again, you know, we need more studies. We, we need more, you know, pooling of various studies. But I think, and I believe that the overwhelming evidence supports it. It's not curative. But I think it, it, it certainly does help. Um, would I go at, you know, 
guzzle, you know, tons of vitamin D pills and hope it prevents COVID? No. But if I have a COVID patient that is sick enough, I probably will put them on vitamin D. And I have been doing that. So have many of my colleagues as well. Got you. I know that there's been a little bit of concern too, you know, when President Trump got um, admitted, it seemed like he got the, the works, you know, that involved a lot of, of a cocktail. Is there, are you able to describe a little bit of what is a typical cocktail that you would give for your patients when they're in the hospital and for COVID and, um, and made it to that level to have an hospital admission? Uh, is, it, is this directed to me, Dr. Lewis? Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned. You mentioned. Uh, well, this is an interesting question, believe it or not. You know, what do I tell people who don't have COVID? Don't get it, mm-hmm. right? Because over the past 11 months and 10 months that we've been dealing with COVID, it's, the, the, the treatment itself has been varied. This is one good case of prevention is better than cure. So our typical cocktail when we started was, you know, we used antibiotics. We didn't have any effective antivirals until when Desiree came out, uh, uh, you know, a few months into the pandemic. And then there was a talk of the hydroxychloroquine. Everybody must have heard about that, which was, you know, uh, mostly not effective. (laughs) And, um, you know, we do have some outpatient monoclonal antibody treatments now. The the Regeneron, which is what, you know, the president got as part of his cocktail regarding patient, but that's available outpatient. We have the bamlunimumab, I can always have a hard time presenting that. But it's evolved over time as we've learned more about the disease, but it it certainly includes antibacterials because some people have a superimposed bacterial pneumonias and some antivirals. We use the vitamin D, C, zinc, like you mentioned. And, you know, um, steroids have, we found have been very useful Obviously, you don't go out and grab steroids in the outpatient, but in, in the inpatient population, we find the use of dexamethasone has been uh, particularly useful. But again, it's evolving. Don't get COVID. Try to prevent it. Stay safe. Get the vaccine. I hear you. Um, there's a question on here. People are concerned uh, about, are there any GI effects, meaning nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or any upset stomach after getting the vaccine, moving back to vaccine stuff that anyone's aware of or has, has encountered uh, in, in your personal experience or uh, patient profiles? Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Thomas. You're the GI specialist. Thank you. Having yeah. a little bit of technical difficulties over here. Thank you for bearing with me. So in response to the question about GI side effects, we know with COVID, the actual infection itself, sometimes people can experience some issues with vomiting, diarrhea. When it comes to the vaccination, however, that the GI side effects are very rare. The most common side effects would be injection site pain. So if you had the injection in your left arm, you would experience pain from that, fatigue, headaches, muscle aches, fevers, chills, and even rigors but diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, those things are not commonly reported when it comes to either Moderna or the Pfizer vaccines. One of the things I wanna uh, talk about here uh, is uh, those patients who come to us and they already have COVID, uh, one of the things that we want to make sure of everyone, for that matter, is take care of your chronic medical conditions. Uh, we don't want to, you know, one of the things that we've seen and uh, is people kind of put aside their regular medications, they stop taking their blood pressure medications, they stop taking their diabetic medications, they stop taking their uh, other medication for rheumatoid arthritis, for other conditions that they that are very helpful for their uh, day to day control of their medical conditions. That is so important because if your conditions are not controlled, if your diabetes is not controlled, if your blood pressure is not controlled, and if you get COVID, you are likely to get more sick. So it's important to make sure that your diabetes control remains good. So we know you it's kind of tough to eat healthy when you have uh, you, you, you don't have an appetite, you don't have the sense of smell or sense of taste and you may be eating less and that you may have to coordinate with your doctor and just make sure that 
Do you need to change some of the doses? Do you need to cut back your insulin? You know, do you need to, you know, uh, make a few adjustments to your medicine? Uh, maybe because you, uh, you're so sick, blood pressure is running too low. You may want to talk to your doctor and say, do you need to, you know, cut, cut back some of those medicine? But it's so important for you to continue with your medications unless you've been told otherwise by your uh, physician or your provider. Okay, um, Dr. Matalvo has a computer glitch, so I'll take over as host for the short for a short period of time here. Um, so I, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Dr. Niamu. Um, I found in my practice as I'm a, 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 a internist that the African American community, especially since the pandemic, has really come out and seen value in terms of primary care medicine. Um, and I would. I would encourage all the African Americans in the black community to come see their PCPs, get their their sugars checked, get their colonoscopies, get their mammograms, do these basic things to, to stay healthy. It's very, very important. Um, number one. Number two, there's a question here. Why didn't more minorities uh, be included in this tri in the trials of these vaccines? Um, uh, I'll, I'll look to Dr. Ani uh, for that answer. That was a question, why didn't more minorities? Yes. Well, well, um, if you recall the slide that we reviewed, it was about 10% in both the Moderna and the Pfizer study. It, you actually wanted a vaccine trial that kind of mi mirrors the distribution of the population in, in the United States, which is right about what it is. There are certain cases where we do what we call oversampling, where we'd sample a much higher proportion of a certain population, but this was not necessary or appropriate in this case. So they sampled as many people, as many African Americans as you would find in the traditional US population. And there was really no need to sample more. Yes, so so I would agree with that. Uh, like I said, the the, African American population in the United States is 12 to 14 percent. Um, in both those trials, there were 10 percent uh, African American, so relatively close to the general population. Okay, um, I think we're, we're we're wrapping things up here. Um, Dr. Lopes, uh, do you have something that you'd like to say? Um, I just wanted to met, talk about the the question on COVID in children. So Dr. Montalvo, Dr. West and I, we work in the urgent care where we do see a lot of children with COVID. They generally tend to have milder symptoms. Uh, but remember, we talked about those multi-generational homes in LA, right? Or if they're going to grandma's yeah. house and they just have sniffles, they are, they, they're known as amplifiers. But then grandma or grandpa will get sick with worse side effects. So children still do need to wear masks. The symptoms are milder. Um, we still need to follow mitigation and um, and all of the the practice standards that we've the safety standards that we have in place. Okay. Um, so this has been great, uh, and we're working on a hour and a half here, and I'm going to try to start wrapping things up. Um, and in doing that, uh, I have to say some special thank yous for this program. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, um, all the, our audience, uh, all the people that tuned in. Um, we know it's a lot on your Saturday afternoon to come and talk about COVID and the vaccine. Uh, might not be exciting to most, but it's very exciting to us here at the BPC. So thank you so much for coming um, and uh, uh, hearing us speak about uh, this topic. And, um, this is a conversation, and this conversation we don't want to end. Uh, obviously, there's a lot in terms of healthcare in the United States that we can try to do better, and uh, the BPC is committed in terms of health equity. Um, and I also like to thank the folks at the BPC, guys. Thank you so much for, for all the hard work and and dedication you had to this project. It it really warms my heart. Um, Last but not least, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Montalvo. Oh, you're back. Uh, man, your hosting skills are out of control, let me tell you. Um, I felt very comfortable with you as the host. So uh, you, did a, you did a phenomenal job, and, and I thank you for everything that you've done. All I got to say is let's do this again sometime real soon. <laughs>